Okay, good, e good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Nina Olson. I'm the director of the Center for Taxpayer Rights, and we're here for our second tax chat. And the theme of the tax chat today is human rights, uh, taxpayer rights, human rights, and sustainable development goals. And last week in an alternate universe, we would have all been in Pretoria, South Africa to hold the International Conference on Taxpayer Rights, which was pretty much on this very subject. And unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we, we have rescheduled that conference to next year, this week next year. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that, but we thought it would be a good idea to bring some of the presenters from that conference here for our second tax chat. Um, and so let me just introduce our presenters and then talk a little bit about what we're gonna do on this panel. Um, I've had all the guests um, uh, muted and what we would like to have is that if you have a question or a comment during the discussion, the conversation part with our our, our guests, um, just put it in chat and I'll be monitoring it. And if it's relevant to the conversation, we'll ask it while we go along. If it's not relevant then, or to that particular discussion, we'll, I'll bring it up at the end. And at the end, we will have a time for people to unmute and ask questions and engage in conversation as well. So um, our presenters are really wonderful people. I'm sure you all know that. Uh, Real Franzen is the director of the African Tax Institute in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, and he holds the South Africa Research Chair in Tax Policy and Governance there. He specializes in land and um, property taxation, and he regularly acts as a policy advisor for lots of international organizations, the IMF, the UN, the World Bank. Um, Annette Ogutu is a professor of tax law in the Department of Taxation, Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the University of Pretoria. And her specialization is in international tax laws. She's the author of the book, International Tax Law, Offshore Tax Avoidance in South Africa. And she was a member of the Davis Tax Committee um, Commission. Uh, and she was appointed by the South African Minister of Finance for, from 2013 to 2018 to assess South Africa's tax policy framework. And she chaired the BEPS and the Corporate Income Tax Subcommittee. And she was a commissioner of the South African Law Reform, South Africa Law Reform Commission from 2014 to 2018. And then we have Asha Ramgobin, who is the executive director and co-founder of the Human Rights Development Initiative. And she's worked extensively with university-based legal aid clinics across Africa. Um, and um, the uh, initiative is an innovative and collaborative effort of key public interest lawyers and stakeholders who use international and regional human rights mechanisms to advocate with and on behalf of communities within Africa. She's also an LLD candidate, um, researching tax havens and international law at the African Tax Institute and the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria. So that's my introduction of folks. Um, as I said, the theme of the conference, the, the panel is taxpayer rights, human rights and sustainable development goals. And we're gonna have three sections. Um, the first one is gonna focus on the obligation of governments to harness necessary revenue to achieve sustainable development goals for its citizenry and the right of citizens to have their needs met. Um, and then we'll segue into the other two sections, which are taxpayer rights in the, in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, including implications for taxpayer trust, national and local tax relief, and conditions for obtaining tax relief. And then third, we're going to discuss approaches to addressing an international tax structure that undermines developing countries' efforts to achieve sustainable development goals 
let me admit somebody, um, including illicit financial flows and abuses of COVID-19 relief measures. So that's a big agenda, but I think we're going to be able to cover it. And I think this discussion will be really interesting. So I think we'll start off again. This is really talking about the obligation of governments to you know, raise enough revenue that they can basically achieve the sustainable development goals for their citizenry and then the rights of citizens to have their needs met. And in that context, Real, why don't you um, start off with just talking a little bit about the African Tax Institute, why you wanted to host the International Conference for Taxpayer Rights, and, and then we can enter into a discussion about taxpayer rights as human rights. Thank you very much, Nina. Uh, good day, everyone. Good evening to some of us. Um, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, and I thoroughly look forward to, to the discussion. Very quickly, the African Tax Institute, or its predecessor, the Southern African Tax Institute, was established uh, in 2002 with a primary goal to do capacity development in the public sector in the area of tax policy and tax administration. So our focus clients were all, uh, always uh, tax authorities and also um, uh, revenue authorities and ministries of finance to a lesser extent, ministries of local government and even municipalities. Um, when we formally uh, established the African Tax Institute way back in 2007, our focus shifted from short courses to more um, postgrad programs. So since 2009, we offer a interdisciplinary masters in taxation, uh, tax policy and tax administration, M full taxation, we call it, in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences, but closely aligned with the Faculty of Law. And uh, we also, in 2012, commenced with a doctoral program. And to date, we've delivered 17 doctoral students in the area of taxation. And also, we have currently 16 doctoral students actively involved with their research, and also um, two students that will join the program in January. So I think at the high level, we're making a contribution to the African continent. Although most of the students are South African, we've had students also from Zimbabwe, uh, two successful students who graduated this year from Ghana, and also further afield from um, Brazil. Our master's program, we've taken in small groups annually, but we've graduated, I think, close to 150 students already. And the vast majority of them from a revenue authorities and from ministries of finance. So I think we're also making a sound contribution in the understanding of tax policy issues and tax administration issues, the broader picture in the African context. Now, I think the Africa Tax Institute is a worthy co-host of the sixth international conference on taxpayer rights. Uh, but we're not going to be the only partners. We are going to partner with the Faculty of Law's uh, Center for Human Rights. Now, the Center for Human Rights was established way back in 1986, during the really dark days of apartheid, the last few years of the previous regime, and uh, during the time of um, state of emergency, as a voice uh, against some of the abuses of the time. And uh, this uh, center has also grown and uh, over the years uh, started offering a master's program. Now they offered five different master's programs in the area of uh, human rights, uh, predominantly with the African focus. They've won the 2006 UNESCO Prize for Human Rights Education and also the African Union Prize in 2012 for their assistance to uh, the Human Rights Commission and People's Rights Commission in Africa. So it's a worthy co-partner. And it's for us a privilege to work with the Faculty of Law. And very quickly, the University of Pretoria in its own right, I think is also in a way a testimony for um, the transformation of South Africa. Way back in the early 1980s, this university was an all white Afrikaans uh, language university, and that has changed dramatically. Although there are still some challenges regarding especially representativity and transformation 
at the, the academic level of staff, we've come a very long way to a university that is now ranked uh, regularly amongst the top 500 universities in the world. And the law faculty is ranked number one in Africa and in the top 100 law faculties in the world by Times Higher Education. So I think uh, we as an institution would be a worthy partner. We've got wonderful facilities and it's a pity we couldn't get together last week, but we look forward to uh, next year's conference that will be hosted at the University of Pretoria. And I hope that our participants will join us for, for that conference. Mm -hmm. I think let me stop at that point and hand back to you, Nina. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful to just put a context on what, you know, the conference and, and just the activity that's been going on. So Annette, can you just talk you know, about the importance and relevance of taxation to achieving sustainable development goals? And, and what are those goals for some of the folks who may not be thinking along those lines? Thank you so much for having me, Nina. I hope you can hear me all. Yeah, thank you for the audience for making it. Uh, even though we couldn't meet in person last week, we hope that uh, this tax chat will get us um, ready for next year's conference. Well, I'll get started then with the sustainable development goals. And I'll just take a little bit of a step back as Nina has requested for those of us that are not so conversant with those goals and what they are all about. Well, at the UN summit in September, 2015, the UN issued the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, which comprises 17 interconnected goals that address global challenges that are related to human development to achieve a better and more sustainable future for everyone. The relevant global challenges relate to things like poverty, hunger, health, education, gender inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, uh, prosperity, fair labor, peace, as well as the development of institutions and partnerships that are necessary to see progress in these areas. Now, achieving these goals is fundamental to the protection of human rights. Um, a global conference on tax and sustainable development goals was organized in 2018 by the Platform for Collaboration on Tax, and this comprises the OECD, IMF, and the World Bank. And, um, and they highlighted the importance of tax in achieving sustainable development goals. Taxation plays a fundamental role in raising revenues to ensure welfare of citizens by providing essential public goods and services and financing the labor force and of course promoting economic development. Now, developing countries uh, require large amounts of revenues to fund resources for ending poverty, and that is a Sustainable Development Goal, or SDG 1, uh, Zero Hunger and Malnutrition, that is SDG 2, Quality Education 4, Good Health and Wellbeing 3, Clean Water and Sanitation 4, uh, Affordable Energy 7, Infrastructure 9, and the inequalities uh, to be reduced in 10, as well as strong institutions which are in SDG 16. Taxation is also key to promoting economic growth by equitably distributing public resources to promote gender equality, which is SDG 5, decent work and economic growth, which is 8, sustainable cities and communities, which is SDG 11, responsible consumption, SDG 12, climate action, 13, life below water, 14, life on land, 15, and then partnerships for those goals, which is SDG 17. The OECD estimates that at least 15% of GDP in revenue is necessary to finance these goals. But in almost 30 of the 75 poorest countries, tax revenues are below this 15% uh, threshold. It's therefore important for developing countries to know how to better target tax efforts to achieve the SDGs through <clears throat> well-structured revenue generating system to meet the needs of the present generation 
without jeopardizing the needs and the interests of future generations. I'll stop there, Nina, and I'll take it on after that. Thank you. Okay, that, that, thank you, Annette. That really helps frame what the linkage is between taxation and achieving these sustainable development goals. Um, but Asha, you know, could you connect the dots between taxation, human rights, and then state obligations under international human rights law? Yes, thanks. Thanks so much, Nina. Uh, just to follow through on Annette on the SDGs before I get to uh, this connecting the dots on taxation, human rights, and um, and international human rights law. Um, SDG 16.4 also clearly stipulates that um, by 2030, illicit financial flows has to be significantly reduced um, so that we can strengthen uh, domestic resource mobilization efforts. But there's been a big problem with this because of uh, reaching any kind of agreement on what illicit financial flows actually mean. Uh, but I'm sure Annette will talk about that later. And I can also come in on that issue uh, a little later. But let's look at, I don't know how many human rights lawyers there are among us today. If there are, you're going to be exceedingly bored at least for the first two or three minutes of this. Uh, but if there aren't, then, then let, me just, let me just say this. Under international human rights law, states have the obligation to basically respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. Well, what does this mean in the context of, let's, let's, let's look at one right, let's look at the right to health, considering we're in a COVID context and health issues are so paramount. So let's look at what this actually means in tangible terms within the context of the right to health. So the obligation to respect, this generally entails refraining from doing anything to interfere with the enjoyment of a, of a right. And you can, you, one would imagine that this then doesn't require too many resources or anything like that. But when we think about a tangible example of how this actually manifests, for example, let's look at a person living with HIV, goes to a public hospital and is denied treatment because they are HIV positive. This is a reality that we faced not very long ago uh, when we were dealing with HIV issues. What, what does the government obligation to respect, respect entail in this context? It means that the state needs to train its personnel so that it under, the, the personnel understand their duties, their obligations when it comes to these different complex and new uh, circumstances. Okay, so remember in tangible terms, it requires the state to train. Then let's look at the obligation to protect. Here, the state has to actually do something positive. It has to protect people, individuals, institutions. It has to protect us from the interference of our rights by a third party. Now, in many countries, health is privatized. In the, the health services are basically offered by private institutions. What is the role of government in, that, just in, in those contexts, right? If a private institution is providing substandard services, substandard medication, for example. Let's look at, let's look at a concrete circumstance in Tanzania. For, in Tanzania, there was a person called Babu who claimed to have a cure for HIV. There was this concoction, it literally was called a concoction, a cup that, uh, of some kind of liquid that people would take their, take their loved ones out of, a private, out of the public hospital or the private hospital and go to this particular healer and uh, try to get this cup and, and be cured from things like cancer, HIV. What is the state obligation in this context? The obligation is to protect vulnerable people, to protect people from that kind of, that kind of uh, behavior. And so what does the state need to do? The state needs to enact laws that regulate 
these these circumstances. They need to have institutions where uh, medication and medicines are actually uh, approved. So we we have you have the Center for Disease Control. We have uh, the Medical Council of South Africa, and in and in Tanzania it was the National Institute of Medical Research or something, NIMR. NIMR. Those are the kinds of steps that governments need to take. Again, it, governments need money to respect, government need, governments, governments need money to protect, and now comes fulfill. Fulfillment of, your, of, of, a, of a human rights obligation requires that governments apply in the context of social, economic, and cultural rights, maximum available resources. Okay, to ensure that the that the different types of institutions, personnel are all available for, uh, are all there and, and able to actually perform um, the, the, their different duties, right? In the context of health, it becomes even more complicated and more uh, important because many of the international bodies, the UN Human Rights Committee, the African uh, Commission on Human and People's Rights have all uh, defined the right to health to include the underlying determinants of the right to health. So, for example, water, access to water, sanitation, nutrition, housing, all these components include are included in the right to health. As, as you can see, I'm sure resources and revenue are absolutely necessary for a government to fulfill its human rights obligation under, um, un under international standards. I talked about maximum available resources. For the longest time, human rights lawyers and advocates have looked at the maximum available resources, that whole issue about, and they've looked at it from the perspective of analyzing government budgets. So how much is a government spending on defense as opposed to health, for example. Whereas the growing argument that is now being put forward is that the government obligation around max use of maximum available resources is not limited to how much they spend in relationship to other budget line items, but it is also about the government harnessing the maximum available resources that they ought to. So the normative component here is to ensure that the cake is as large as it should be, or that the pot is as full as it should be. And this is where the connection comes in relationship to taxation, human rights, uh, and international human rights uh, obligations under the international human rights system. So for example, when a government enters into a double tax agreement, grants a tax incentive, puts together a suite of tax incentives, grants tax holidays, for example, they, these steps need to be tested against a particular standard in terms of which governments need to be um, looking at these steps that they take against the type of revenue that they would have, they would have generated had they not granted those tax in incentives or those tax holidays and that. So a cost benefit analysis needs to be done to ensure that these, these steps that governments take actually do generate the um, larger quantities of revenue and are not um, um, reducing the government revenue. Um, so these questions, just the last uh, statement I would like to make is that these questions have been raised within the international human rights forums, particularly the Human Rights Committee, the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee, the African uh, Commission on, the hum on Human and People's Rights, but they also need to be addressed in the forums around international taxation so that we can see the interplay on the two sides. Uh, I'll stop there and we'll hopefully continue with some of these issues later.
And that's great, Asha. Um, Real, you know, you focus a lot on property tax and, you know, in the United States, property tax is very local. So do you want to give a chat about, you know, just how property tax relates to exempt, for example, to sustainable development goal 11 and what you found in your own research around the world in terms of the role it plays? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I will mostly focus on property tax in the narrow sense as the recurrent tax that is laid on usually the value of land and or buildings at a local government level. But of course, one must also understand property tax in the, its broader definition of all property related taxes. So including at usually the national level, property transfer taxes or stamp duties which especially on the African continent and in many other developing countries contributes significantly to overall tax revenue. And uh, it's usually a very easy tax handle, the transfer taxes, but these taxes can uh, very often undermine the value-based local recurrent property tax because people will tend to under-declare values to save on uh, transfer tax or stamp duty. So, uh, but my focus will really be on, on the, the recurrent tax and especially in the context of SDG 11, the sustainable cities and, and human, human settlements. And I'm just going to refer to a few statistics that I got from the UN website. And uh, it states that in 2008 already, the global urban population uh, ex went beyond um, 50%. So people living in cities exceed the number of people's or people living in uh, rural areas. And it's expected that by 2050, uh, two thirds of the world population, that's about 6.5 million people will be living in urban areas. And that currently there's about 70 million people added to cities across the world annually, and obviously mostly so in the developing world. So uh, a, a downside of all of this is that 25% of the urban population currently are slum dwellers. And the numbers of slum dwellers or the percentage is not coming down, it's actually growing. And there's of course an important link already also with, with uh, basic human rights, the right to life, the right to health and, and education and the like. So uh, as, as, as uh, Annette already mentioned, uh, SDG 11 is also part of the 2013 30 agenda. And it states that makes cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Now, obviously to do this, you require revenue. Uh, and I just want to add that uh, there's a recognition of the cross-cutting nature of urban issues, which have an impact on a number of other sustainable development goals, including uh, SDG 1, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12, 15, and of course 17, which is a very important one. What kinds of global partnerships can be formed uh, like the Cities Network in Africa and uh, South African Cities Network and a number of other initiatives across the world. And it's also important to just mention that the UN Habitat Conference, uh, the UN Habitat 3 in Ecuador 2016, also seek to offer national local guidance on the growth and development of cities through to 2036. And I just think the current pandemic that we are all experiencing globally is already impacting on the way we think about cities and how we are going to plan our future cities and the use of buildings and the like and people working from home. So all of these things are really interesting in the way that impact on the property market and therefore also on property values. But it's safe to say that urbanization is uh, massive, it's rampant in Southeast Asia and Africa. A big issue though is in Southeast Asia, there's a growth in wealth in cities and therefore um, there's uh, public, uh, high, higher quality public services and infrastructure. Whereas in Africa, there's a lot of urbanization taking place, but not so much a growing of wealth and therefore lack in proper infrastructure and local services. And although the larger cities, the mega cities or the metropolitan areas, 
and generally, to a large extent, take care of themselves through own source of revenue and limited national and other uh, grants and transfers, uh, smaller cities, somewhere between half a million and 2.5 billion, are growing rapidly without significant support from uh, higher levels of, of government. So it is critical to look at own source revenue and property tax or the recurrent tax is a really good source of revenue. It's a buoyant source of revenue if it is well administered. But the problem is it's not an easy tax to administer at any level of government, but especially at the local government where there may be a paucity of skills, for example, to do the valuation. If you are going to have a value system and it's generally accepted that the value-based system is the most equitable type of local property. Real, we're losing you. We've lost your connection. So you try and value all properties, let's say, to, that doesn't happen in many cases. Excuse me? Yeah, in many cases, you have the issue with... Yeah. Yeah, you have the issue with... Uh, uh, preferential treatment, for example, for residential taxpayers. So why would you want to spend a lot of money to value all properties to market value, let's say residential, non-residential and so forth. So that could be an issue. And we find that in many countries, there's also in a way discriminatory action against tenanted properties. So there's special preferential treatment for a second home which went out. There's no special treatment. But this is the case very common in India, in Pakistan, and also in Uganda. And that means really that the owner of a second home who is maybe in a position okay. to uh, real just the human rights yes we're losing we've lost you for the, the last uh, minute or so okay yeah sorry the connection is not yeah. that good yeah, it's breaking up. um if you don't find i'll switch off my video and see if that helps yeah. okay see if that helps that's great thank you okay so I'm just saying that the, the, the link between the property tax and, and human rights is also a common one. And some of the most prominent uh, uh, cases across the world have been uh, equal protection clause, for example, in the United States. I think Proposition 13 in the US is an example of exactly that. Now, Proposition 13, after 42 years, will be voted on again, apparently a month from now in November, and if uh, the vote is carried, they may have a Proposition 15, which will see a differentiation again between residential property owners and commercial properties and a significant shift of the tax burden to, to commercial properties. But as we all know, commercial properties may have the benefit of shifting the burden back onto consumers or onto labor or onto shareholders and so forth. So, it's expected that the brunt of, of, of the shift will be carried by small businesses. And maybe all of this came along before a COVID-19. And you can just imagine how COVID-19 has made a massive impact um, on, on all taxes, but also at the local level on the property tax on both sides. One must consider the uh, pro problems for the municipality or local government who must raise revenue to provide basic services, but also consider uh, tax relief for taxpayers who may be struggling, be they residential or non-residential. I think I sh I'll stop there for the moment. We can get back to specific ways of providing relief, uh, for example, for COVID-related tax relief at a later stage. Yeah, but just to say then that the property tax is a uh, tax that is really in the mix when it comes to basic human rights at the local government level where so much is happening. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Asha, I just wanted to ask one follow up and then maybe we'll come back later, you know, to some of the other questions. But one was that you noted that the duty to pay tax exists in the African Human Rights Charter. So how is that framed and what normative issues would you suggest need to be addressed going forward? I can't up oh, wait, somehow you're muted. Hold on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. So we had a storm here in Pretoria last night and I think that's what's the cause of real and my internet connection issue. I'm not sure Annette, if it was as bad there, but if, if, I'm, if my screen freezes up, just let me know and I'll also do the video, uh, switch off my video. Um, okay. So the duty to pay tax exists in both the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and the Inter-American Inter Declaration. In our charter, it's framed uh, that in this way, the individual has a duty to work to the best of his ability and competence and to pay taxes imposed by law in the interests of society. The individual has a duty to pay to, to work to the best of his abilities and competence and to pay taxes imposed by law in the interests of society. This is Article 29.6 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Now, duties in international human rights law are not as individual duties, are not as uh, clearly defined as they should be. In the context of this particular duty, I would like to start by saying that there has been absolutely no normative content given. This, this uh, provision uh, was put into both um, human rights instruments with a great deal of foresight. The founding fathers, as always, the founding fathers of, and, and mothers of our constitutions and our bills of rights and all of that, and now I have some other flying creature that decided to come and join me here. But anyway, um, as, in, as in most circumstances, um, our founders have gr a great deal of insight, but then when the ball is now in our court to actually use these, these uh, tools that they have placed in our hands, we then sometimes abdicate the responsibility. So the duty, the individual duty to pay tax has within it a range of different issues, questions that need to be answered. I, I can raise many of the questions, suggest some answers, but at the end, it, it is up to the African Commission to actually provide the normative standards here. So the first question is, how is an individual defined? Does an individual include a non-state actor in the form of a corporation? African Commission jurisprudence so far in other contexts um, has been such that yes, it does include uh, non-state actors. So we can, if, if they get around to actually developing the normative standards around this particular article, we can definitely take, um, we can definitely hope and have a good foundation for that hope that that non-state actors in the form of um, corporations would be included. Um, the next question is, how is the concept of duty defined and understood within the context of international law? Does this duty, the individual duty, so I have a duty to pay tax to the best, to work to the best of my ability and competence and to pay tax in the interest of society. I have that duty. What concomitant obligation arises from that duty on the state? I'm a citizen of South Africa, I'm a taxpayer in South Africa. So for me to actually fulfill this duty, what obligations then arise for the state? And that, that's an, the next question. And the answer that I propose is that the state has the obligation to develop laws and systems to actually collect tax and then use those taxes in the interest of society. Um, and those laws have to be reviewed constantly to ensure that they actually are effective in revenue collection. 
And then within this context, again, what is the legal obligation of legal professionals and accountants in, the, in this context? In, we have a duty to pay tax, all of us, all individuals, all non-state actors have a duty to pay tax, to work, I'm, I'm gonna repeat this over and over again, to work to the best of our ability and competence and to pay tax in the interest of society. This is our duty. What obligation then do lawyers have when they are crafting tax avoidance and moving from gray to black in the tax evasion framework? What obligations do they have? But more importantly, what obligations arise for governing bodies, the, the, those institutions that actually uh, deal with the ethical uh, duties and ethical responsibility of lawyers. So should, not, should they not then be regulated and should the ethical codes not be reviewed to ensure that these aspects of uh, tax, tax evasion and avoidance tactics and strategies are addressed because they actually contravene this particular um, human rights obligation. And then what are the obligations of state parties in relationship to each other? In Africa, there are 53 state parties to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Morocco is not a state party to the Charter, so that's why they, it's 53. So what are the obligations of states to each other in relationship to this? When one state enacts provisions and, 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 and creates a system uh, that compromises the ability of another state to harness, well, not harness maximal, maximum available resources, let's, let's talk about this Article 29.6, to fulfill its obligations under Article 29.6, then what consequences arise from that? So um, at some point we might come to this obligation uh, under international human rights law. This exists in international human rights law, not in the general body of law, the solidarity and obligation to cooperate. It, these, these are, the, the, there are provisions in international human rights treaties that actually stipulate these obligations now. When you look at this kind of interstate responsibility, um, how does the how does the conduct of one state impact on on the ability of another state to realize this particular uh, area? And the, the the as I said, the the founding founders of, well, in, in the African Charter, it was founding fathers, let's just accept that and move on. <laughs> uh, the founding fathers had great insight, as I said. Uh, now it's up to us to actually test this, up to us as lawyers to actually take cases to the African Commission to, to ask the African Commission to advocate before them to, for them to develop normative uh, standards around this and give us guidelines as to what the state obligation then, it, what is the state obligation? So individuals have the duty to pay tax in the inter-American system and in the African system. What obligations arise from that for states? They need to actually give us that in, in, a, in a authoritative document and we need to advocate for that. Um, so I'll just stop there. That's great. So, so let's, th thank you. So let's bring this to um, the present day where, you know, the implications of the pandemic, where um, um, as we were talking about, about health, you know, the SDG on health is that there's so much going on and then the effect on the economy um, and the ability of countries to raise the, the, the maximum available resources um, in order to care for their citizenry. Um, you know, I, I worked on, I co-authored an article with Eric Kirkler and Benno Torgler and, and Jim Alm a few months, a month ago or so, um, that was really looking at how should tax administrations move forward, um, both not just during the pandemic, but after the pandemic. And part of what we were trying to focus on, in addition to looking at the actions that they'd done so far, was how do you enable people to have confidence that 
if they pay taxes, things are going to be used appropriately. And the expectations may be very, very high. And it's very possible because the, the agency's own infrastructure has been damaged that they themselves won't be able to deliver. And so um, we really came down to a lot of this really depends on trust and you know that, that the citizenry has trust in the institutions. Um, that they are doing the best that they can, but also that the institutions, you know, take actions to ensure that there aren't any free riders, that people aren't taking advantage of the COVID provisions, you know, inappropriately. Um, and then also recognizing that, that, yes, there is a duty to pay tax, but there may be literally an inability to pay that tax that was enacted years before, not contemplating a pandemic and the ec economy that results from the pandemic. So, you know, real, we've talked a little bit about what you've seen in the context of property tax and people's ability to pay. So do you want to address that at the local level? And then, Asha, maybe you can talk about what you're seeing in some of the COVID relief packages to deal with you know, the free riders, the abuses. Mm -hmm. And then I think we'll go to Annette to sort of segue into our next segment, talking about illicit financial flows and how they impact taxpayer trust. Is that real? Yeah, okay. I'll, again, I'll switch off my uh, video just in case. So uh, yeah, the, the problem with, with uh, property tax and, and COVID-19 is that you're trying to balance, but this is throughout also at the national level, the challenges for individuals and businesses on the one side uh, who will need relief in one form or another, and then of course governments who will need more revenue to deal not only with the pandemic but also with uh, the post-pandemic realities uh, of uh, providing services and because urbanization is going to take place irrespective. But I'll just cite a few interesting examples that I came across uh, I've been working in Zambia recently and the recent 2018 Rating Act, that's the Property Tax Act in Zambia allows for individual applications for remission, that's tax relief. And um, this can be done by simply knocking on the door of the municipality and telling them what your issue is and why you require tax relief. Now you can just imagine what an administrative nightmare this can be normally but even under these abnormal COVID-19 circumstances, if a city like Lusaka with 3 million uh, uh, you know, inhabitants, let's say 300, 400,000 taxpayers, if all of a sudden many of them start knocking on the door of the municipality individually for some form of relief or remission of tax, it's going to be almost impossible to deal with. And the act states that if the council does not deal with this application for We're losing you, Rio. So, that is really just uh, awful for the if that should happen. Uh, Real? Because uh, it will on, on their re relief. Real, can you repeat that? What happens if, they, if the municipality, the commission does not act? We, we broke up there for a minute. Yeah, if the, if the municipality does not respond to this application within 90 days, the application is granted automatically, the remission, which means that uh, the municipality will be drained of, of funds if thousands and thousands of taxpayers uh, pay up. But I guess if you look at a few responsible ways that councils are trying to deal with the pandemic and trying to provide relief, uh, some cities, uh, the city of Auckland in New Zealand, for example, said they would postpone their valuation for, for at least one year. Mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, they are arguing that, uh, that commercial properties that have been valued in January this year, uh, just before the pandemic really hit in, in, in Japan, should not be taxed on this new 2020 value. In South Africa, most of the cities grant some form of relief through rebates or through just uh, waiving the tax or at least waiving interest and penalties for folks who are in arrears uh, for a number of months. And it's not only dealing with those who are in arrears, but also saying that those who can pay, if they pay uh, in advance, 
they can get a rebate. Now you can say, but why would you want to do that? Of course, it's an issue of cash flow for the municipality. So if so many taxpayers are not paying and these are residential or non-residential, that is an issue. So they require funding throughout. So if taxpayers who can pay the tax at least pay up now, they get a rebate, but at least the municipality gets in some uh, tax uh, money with which they can provide services. So um, there are quite a number of other examples, but maybe we, we can hand over, especially with my link that seems to be quite unstable <laughs> to Annette. So Asha, to go to just continuing with the COVID relief, you know, there's so many provisions mm. that have been utilized in the world and you're seeing, you know, we're certainly in the United States seeing some abuse of that fraud, fraud going into applications for special loans and special grants mm. and things. But you had commented that in some of the countries, they are actually, they are putting conditions on yes. um, the, the ability to get grants or special treatments. Mm. Do you want to address some of that? Yeah. So um, I'll just read a quick quote from uh, the State Secretary for Finance, Taxation and Tax Administration of the Netherlands uh, from June 2019. He said that it is not appropriate to ask for tax money in dire times and avoid tax at the same time. That is why the cabinet explicitly sets conditions for supporting individual companies. So what's really interesting is that it's Netherlands that says this. Um, and, I'll, and I'll explain that in a, in a short while, but at the beginning in the April, May, um, so fairly early on, Denmark, Poland, France, Argentina, Scotland, and, and now we hear Netherlands as well, um, were all countries that included uh, specific conditions. So generally, if we want to just summarize what those conditions entailed, it was that if a company had any sort of presence in a tax haven with a subsidiary, um, for example, they would not be eligible to receive those tax relief, those relief packages, COVID relief packages. Now, Tax Justice Network, I must just say that this is not, you know, a rider, a little rider here. This is of great interest to me, but it's not necessary. It's definitely not my uh, field of expertise. I'm specifically looking at Philip Baker, uh, who's, who is an expert in double tax agreements and all of that. So um, be gentle when the question times come, the question time comes. But from my understanding, what has happened here is that countries like Denmark, Poland, France, they all had really good intentions and they wanted to make a specific point that tax havens are harmful and that, that uh, they do not want to tolerate this situation where their public money is basically being abused by big corporations, uh, particularly in a, in a COVID type context. But when organizations like Tax, Tax Justice Network analyzed the specific uh, provisions of these, um, these conditions, right? the, the text of the conditions, they, you know, the devil is always in the detail. And, uh, and so when they went through it, there were many, many problems that were, that were identified. Um, and the problems, one of the major ones that I would just highlight is this, is that when you say a company that has a presence, a subsidiary or something in a tax haven, what is the ta who is this tax haven? So most of these EU countries were depending on that on the EU list. The EU list has countries like Panama and uh, you know a range of others, but they exclude they exclude the UK, they exclude uh, Netherlands, they exclude. EU-based tax havens, which are the last, largest ones. So the impact of this, uh, of these, of these provisions, uh, you, you know, w w was not as 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 uh, uh, drastic as it should have been. But somebody from, you know, some some of the health uh, health practitioners. That's my field. Some of the tax practitioners. Um, that were interviewed, they, they concluded that actually, while 
the the detail you know the, the details of the provisions and all of that might not have been properly and uh, effectively drafted there was a real deterrent effect mm -hmm. so companies afraid of reputational risk in that mm -hmm. were not just diving in to go and apply for these relief packages because of the conditionality that's attached um so my you know I have not been able to identi identify any African country that has actually even gone near these provisions. I don't know if Annette and Riel have come across anything, but I have not yet come across a single African country that has uh, at least suggested in a public statement that, uh, you know, COVID relief packages will not be available to countries, I mean, to companies that have a presence in tax havens, at least saying something like that as a public policy statement and not, you know, even not following up with regulations. I have not yet heard that, definitely not in South Africa. And um, I haven't heard it from any other country yet. And I think it's a really important, I mean, the, the government of Netherlands, as, as I quoted earlier on, when you're dodging taxes during the good times, now, when it's 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 uh, difficult times, it's 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 not quite appropriate. There's one more point that just comes to mind that I would like. Actually, just two very quick points that I would like to bring up at this point. You know, when we're talking about COVID relief packages and tax havens, one of the you, you know I was in a I was in a webinar um, early on in, in in the day. You know, right at the beginning where they were looking at international law issues relating to uh, COVID and all the issues that one needs to think about, right? And two things were brought up there. They had a, a, a head of a very large multinational corporation who talked about risk aversion. And one of the things that they do to minimize risk is, is deal with liquidity at time, during times of risk, right? When these companies, if their liquidity, basically if their money is sitting offshore, surely, surely the government, when they're actually putting together the, when, when, they, when they're administering the relief uh, programs, uh, need to take into account the liquidity of the company as a whole and not just the, op the local operation. So that's the one point that I wanted to bring up. And the other point is COVID related corruption. Um, where particularly on our continent, it's been obscene. Uh, it's been really, really obscene. And the question has been brought up by some international lawyers and people can, you know, who are in this field, if there's anyone here um, might want to take it up where the question has been asked as to, does this constitute a crime, an in, a crime against humanity? COVID related corruption, can it be classified as a crime against humanity and can the Rome statute actually be invoked? I don't have answers to this. This is not my specialty, but I thought that if there's somebody in the audience that might be, that someone participating that might be interested, it might be an area that they might, they would want to explore further. Oh, that's actually a really fascinating um, point. Um, Annette, you've been very quiet and patient. So um, I wanted to ask you, and this sort of segues into our next discussion, um, you know, how do illicit financial flows impact taxpayer trust and the country's accountability to its citizenry? And, you know, what's the role of the digitized, you know, the digital economy today? And how does that impact, you know, particularly developing countries' ability to address, to achieve sustainable development goals? Do you want to sort of walk us through that a little bit? And then I think we'll just open up the conversation a little. All right. Thank you for having me once again. I think what uh, Asha shared about COVID-19 becomes very relevant when we are dealing with issues uh, pertaining to illicit financial flows because it does exhibit uh, uh, those challenges. So the ability of, of countries to actually collect taxes, especially in developing countries like African countries, is greatly impacted when you have capital flight, especially through illicit financial flows. And uh, some of the estimates are between uh, 50 billion to 80 billion US dollars per annum 
and uh, concerns that actually the revenue lost uh, exceeds the levels of foreign aid uh, that these countries receive. So whereas uh, illicit financial flows do occur in so many countries, they are and are very damaging everywhere, the social and economic impact on developing countries is even more severe given their smaller markets and even their resource base. The gravity of illicit financial flows has over the decades been exposed by the torrent of data leaks that we have all possibly read about. If we can trace back from 2016, for instance, we had the Panama Papers released by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which leaked close to 12 million leaked documents of financial information from just the law firm in Panama, which showed how high net worth individuals, former and current leaders, including those in Africa, have set up shell companies in sacred jurisdictions to hide their great fortune. 2017, we had the Paradise Papers, which exposed the further 13.4 million documents from one single Bermuda law firm of companies and individuals that had their wealth in shell companies. Then there was the 90, 2019 um, Mauritius uh, 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 leaks. And then on the African continent, we had the very disturbing January 2020 Rwanda leaks, which have exposed how family ties of politicians were exploited to invest in offshore shell companies and have left the Angolan country stripped of hundreds of millions of dollars. So what all these leaks are, uh, are, uh, 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 reveal is, is just uh, uh, a tip of the iceberg of both illegal and illegal capital flight that is enabled by the active collusion of the world's biggest banks, specialized firms and accounting firms, just like uh, Asha has said. Just recently, September 2020, last month, the ICJ released the FinCEN files of more than 2,500 documents that involve about 12 trillion, I think, dollars it is of transactions that reveal how some of the world's biggest banks have allowed movement of dirty money around the world. So the scale of this problem, we haven't even yet started scratching. So there is no doubt that the economic fallout as a result of COVID-19 will see an exponential rise of schemes to hide monies in tax shelters. It's therefore important that countries intensify efforts to track and measure such illicit financial flows. But of course, this is very challenging since by their very nature, illicit flows are not transparent or systematically recorded. Effective international cooperation is needed to address deficiencies in all countries that facilitate illicit capital. Obviously for every country losing money illicitly, there is another country that is absorbing it. So structural deficiencies in the financial systems of all countries are responsible for driving the outflow of illicit financial flows. But the problem is not only about illicit financial flows. It also um, comes into, uh, 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 into the line when you talk about base erosion and profit shifting by multinational companies, uh, which engage in schemes that exploit gaps in the interaction of uh, different countries' tax systems to exploit or reduce their taxes and shift profits to low tax jurisdiction, often where there is little or no economic activities that is being performed there. Base erosion and profit shifting, of course, is encouraged by the fact that uh, current domestic uh, rules and international taxation measures have not been grounded over the years in an economic environment uh, uh, um, that is suitable for the current business models. Rather, it has been characterized by a low degree of economic integration, integration across borders rather than today's environment of global players. So this has encouraged businesses to come up with structures that are technically legal, but they take advantage of asymmetries in domestic and international tax rules in order to avoid taxes. This has impacted on the effectiveness of countries' corporate tax systems. That is what is at stake. 
BEPS therefore reduces government tax revenues and it leads to critical underfunding of public investment that could help promote economic growth. And it also impacts negatively on badly needed finances to fund public infrastructure such as goods, roads, and schools. As it is with illicit financial flows, although base erosion occurs in all countries and all countries are concerned about it and the effects are damaging to all, there are especially social and economic factors that are worse for developing countries, given again their small market and their heavier reliance on corporate income tax and often their weaker enforcement capabilities. Uh, the IMF has noted um, in its uh, reports that the spillover effects on uh, base erosion and profit shifting are substantially larger in developed countries, which implies in developing countries, which implies the likely loss of more revenue than it is for developed countries. And um, the lack of administrative uh, capacity in developed Pink countries is exacerbates the matter in Africa, especially because of uh, the lack of uh, proper international tax rules causes more challenges in this regard. What did the international community do? It came up with measures in order to address these challenges. In 2015, the OECD issued 15 BEPS action measures, which are intended to ensure that profits are taxed where economic activities generating those profits are performed and where value is created. If adopted, these measures have the potential to curtail base erosion and profit shifting. I would like to stop there regarding that. If you don't mind, I could say about a bit about the justice of the international tax system. Is that okay with you, Nina? Absolutely. Okay. So as much as the international community is working hard towards uh, um, ensuring that the system works to prevent multinationals from engaging in such activities, because of the rising digital economy, base erosion and profit shifting is exacerbated. And the international community under the umbrella of the OECD inclusive framework is currently working on new international tax rules for the taxation of the digital economy, your so-called pillar one and pillar two proposals. It is important that the foundations of a sustainable international tax system are built on pillars that are anchored on a principled approach, in my view, rather than reacting to the rise of the digital economy. The OECD has recommended that the principles that we all know that guide the taxation of conventional commerce should constitute the basis to evaluate the proposals that are being post, put forward for taxing the digital economy. And these are our well-known principles uh, that are underpin a good tax system, which are the likes of neutrality, efficiency, certainty, simplicity, effectiveness, flexibility, and then comes your fairness and justice. Let me just hone in a little on the justice part. In my view, justice should be a fundamental underlying principle in the design of international tax, tax rules. But it is rarely referred to in the international um, uh, 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 forum, I would say, because international tax rules have been largely shaped by unjust and unfair rules that we are driven by power relations and country, his, country interests historically. The current rules, as I have already alluded, have enabled multinationals not to pay their fair share of taxes in the countries they transact in. And even if you look at the tax treaty rules themselves, they have historically been in favor of capital exporting countries rather than capital importing countries. It is important for those, therefore, that are at the helm of uh, setting the norms of the new international tax order to ensure that changes in the balance of power 
in the composition of the International Society of States uh, uh, take into consideration issues of justice, especially as more and more stakeholders are calling for the fairness of the international tax system. A number of commentators have contended that the design of international tax policy must uphold the goal of global justice and that the outcome of, that, of the international tax regime should entail distributive justice whereby the international tax regime is just to the poorest of countries. Global justice is imperative in order to improve the, legitim the le legitimacy of international tax law in a changing modern international society. That is it for now, thank you. <laughs> That's great. So um, I think because we've got 15 minutes left, I'm gonna open it up for people to ask comments. And then if we don't have any comments, then we can continue on among ourselves. And um, because we've got a number of people, if you wanna just put in the chat, you know, I have, I'd like to say something, then I'll be able to unmute you or I can unmute everybody, but just let me know if there are questions or comments. I don't see anybody. Well, you know, while we're waiting, um, you know, I think, um, Asha, you may have some, you know, you were noting about the role of practitioners, um, lawyers in, in working on these things. And you referenced, I think it was you who referenced a case in UK that came up about the blind, the blind eye ignoring knowledge. Uh, Logan has a question. Let me go unmute Logan in the meantime. Let me find Logan. Where are you? Oh, there you are. There you go. Logan, I think you're unmuted. Can you, we can't hear you. I have unmuted you, so um, can you unmute your own system? He seems to have, do you wanna type it out? Okay, Logan, let's work on you and I'll take it to Alice Abreu and see if she will be able to speak. Hi, uh, yes, so I have a question um, and it's, um, it's for Asha um, because I found fascinating what you described about the human rights charter that imposed an obligation on, I guess, citizens to work to the best of their ability and to pay taxes. And the obligation to pay taxes didn't surprise me, but the obligation to work did surprise me. And so mm -hmm. I wonder if you could provide a, a bit more background. And, you know, I recognize that I mm -hmm. may be from a provincial American um, mentality where we have lots of rights and no duties and, um, but, but, I, but that really yeah. caught my interest. Yeah. So, so Alice, just to say that you have the same duty, the duty to pay taxes in the Inter-American de Declaration as well. I can't remember the actual number, uh, but, but I have it somewhere written in my notes somewhere around. Um, so, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights is a very interesting document. Um, it, it, uh, th there's duties, you know, the, the balance between rights and duties, the balance between individual rights and group rights are very, have been very, very important um, uh, components of the Charter. And, um, you know, I have been reflecting upon this for some time now. Uh, as to where does this come from, really? The duty to work to the best of your ability and competence and, uh, and to pay tax in the interest of society. And I think if you look at the charter as a whole, 
you will see that, you know, the, the, particularly the Bill of Rights within the Charter, you will see that there are the traditional rights, you know, all of, most of the traditional rights are there, except the right to privacy, for example, which you, you wouldn't find the individual right to privacy is not in the African Charter, which is an indication of a different sort of um, idea of what is important in, in, in the human rights uh, context in, you know, for Africa. So you have all these rights and entitlements actually that you can demand. You can demand from the government the right to a fair trial. So they have to provide, they have to build courts. They have to do all these different things, courts, police, prosecutors, the works, right? That's what the right to a fair trial entails. And as, a, as an individual, you are able to demand that. But the charter is designed in such a way that those rights are not just absolute and, 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 and the duty of the individual. If you look at that whole section on duties, it deals with family, you know, duties within the family and a range of different things. I've just uh, honed in particularly on this uh, aspect. I, I have the charter handy. I can, I can uh, you know, in the chat or if you put your email address in there, I would be very happy to share the other aspects of, the, of duties, right? But the idea here is that, yes, you, you know, the, the idea is that, yes, children have children, for example, if we think of a family, children have the right to be, to, to be fed and everything, but they also have to do their chores. So it's a it's a balancing act and, and in a more global then context that yes, we have these rights, but we all for those rights to be realized, the founders recognized from the beginning that for those rights to be recognized, these duties have got to also be fulfilled. You know, um, and you know. I'm studying this notion of duties and going through it in, you know, I'm, I'm really kind of delving into the notion of duties within the international human rights uh, framework. And it's Gandhi that's, that's actually been one of the major proponents of this notion of uh, individual duties that balance rights, that you cannot talk about rights without duties and you cannot talk about duties without rights. They are integrated. And, you know, I, I think the Pope Francis's uh, new encyclical that he's just released on sun yesterday uh, talks quite, quite, uh, quite clearly about all of this from a very, you know, and he talks to all of humanity, not only Catholics and not only Christians, but to all of humanity about the importance of our duties to each other as well. Um, and I think that's that's something that's a conversation that we just you know you know we 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 don't have anymore we don't we no. don't talk about that anymore we're talking about entitlements and rights all the time but not not thinking about for that right to be realized what duties do I have? Asha, you know what's really interesting is when uh, we were developing when I was working on developing the the U.S. Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Um, my, we focus. We had focus groups around the country with both taxpayers and um, practitioners to test some of the language. And we had outlined ten rights and five obligations and five duties of the taxpayers. You know, ten rights of the taxpayers and ten duties of the taxpayers. And the taxpayers and their representatives in different focus groups, but in every single focus group, found it offensive to list the obligations of the taxpayers. Um, they said, well, we all know that we have an obligation to be honest. We all know that we have to do this. And I just thought it was so interesting. And the, you know, I recommended that we keep those obligations, um, but the commissioner decided that we wouldn't do that because people found it offensive, which I thought is a comment on the United States in its own little way. Logan has a, a question. He says, Annette raised the important issue of justice being to foundation of being the foundation of any international tax law. Current discussions on the digital economy totally ignores this. 
Do you think the fact that the OECD and the G20 will eventually decide the allocation of taxing rates in the digital economy is part of the problem? How do we shift the discussion to give proper voice to poorer countries? So Annette, you wanna take that one on? Yes, thanks, Logan. I'll get to you now that you're on. Uh, I've just missed seeing your face. That would be a nice one to see your neighbor in Pretoria. <laughs> but anyhow, good to see you, Logan. And thanks for the question you've, you've raised. Indeed, as I have just said, for me, the fundamental issue that I think has either eluded or has been done on purpose, I don't know is the fact that I think we started off on a wrong note. The first important thing that the international community ought to be, ought to have done, and this was highlighted by the OECD itself in the initial reports it raised in 2015, like I said, that the development of the international uh, uh, new tax laws have got to be based on a principled approach, like I said. And they drew back to 1998 when they came up with uh, rules regarding the taxation of e-commerce when things had just begun. And they said that the rules that relate to the taxation of conventional commerce should also apply to e-commerce and they have cemented that in their new approach. But the challenge here is that as much as um, lip service or whatever intentional or disintentional approach is given to this, there is limited guidance, at least from an international tax platform, on how a principled approach should be embedded in the design of international tax rules. When you come to domestic tax system, the principled approach in the design of tax laws is usually reinforced in some countries by constitutional imperatives. With regard to international tax, the source of law for international tax, such as your tax treaties, international tax guidance, and all sorts of soft law that the OECD, the UN has given out, are guided by general international law principles, such as the notion of good faith for interpreting treaties, in, uh, uh, in, in terms of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. However, these international law principles may not be very helpful in providing guidance on the principles upon which international tax policy should be based. Like I said, this is clearly uh, portrayed when you see the whole evolution of international tax laws back from the, it's a whole decade actually in the 1920s uh, with the League of Nations, the UN, the OECD. It's been shaped literally by history, by war, by power relations, by country interests and political dynamics. If you look at the way the OECD has historically uh, uh, um, uh, um, come up with soft law or directions on guidance how to move. It's been in the interest of its member countries, obviously. And that's why the UN has tried to come up every now and then with a model tax treaty to um, address the interests of developing countries. So those power interests have always been there. Not a big surprise because tax is about uh, what, what, what phrase should I use? The, the strongest in the jungle, it's survival for the fittest. So it's, it's kind of your selfish antagonistic type, type of approach. So if you think that big developed countries that need funding for their own economic development are going to sit there and give developing countries a free ride, uh, you no know, freedom to, to tax as they wish, I think we are we, we, we are being uh, uh, gullible in that regard. I think with the challenges that we have as developing countries, historically we've kept quiet and have left these things for developing countries under the species of the OECD and so forth to set the rules. But I think after independence, many developing countries are strong. You see the G4 force with India, with China, with uh, South Africa, and uh, with so many African countries whose economic development has risen. Many of them are not ready to take it, you know, sitting down. The new 
the new type of countries and economies right now are so concerned about the loss of their revenues that they are fighting back. ATAF that you are part of, Logan, that you're leading, very proud of you and the work you're doing there. I think you've put on a force to be reckoned on by the OECD, by the UN and all sorts of organizations that before they actually beginning put things down, they always think, okay, what's the voice coming from Africa? And they're always checking back on us every now and then. The challenge is, as you are raising in your question, are they listening? Are we taking ground? Is there any change that is going to take place? We are not going to get it easy, I must say, but our voices must be strong and loud. There was a UN workshop on the practical and policy aspects on taxation in the digital economy that took place on 9 to 11 September just last month. And I presented a paper on this. And with me, of course, like, uh, 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 Michael Lina from the UN says, I just say it as it is. I mean, I'm an academic, so I don't have any, you know, I don't work for any multinational or government representative. So mine, I put it as it is. If the revenue is, if there is no fair allocation of taxing rights, I'll say it and we'll keep on pushing the boundaries. Logan, let's not keep quiet. Believe me, we will not get it easy. It's not going to come on the golden plate. But we can see that the effort that developing countries have put in actually pushed for some of their base erosion concerns to be included in the BEPS action plans. They are listening hard ears, but they are listening and we are breaking up little by little. I'm so proud of the big voices about the concerns of the current, uh, of the proposals to tax the digital economy that developing countries are pushing so hard on, concerns about you know, lack of adherence to the, 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 the principles that I've just talked about that should, add, should underpin uh, international tax system. Simplicity, I am telling you, those of you that are not in this platform, the complexity of the large new legislation we have it's just too complex for even those people who have enacted, who are coming up with uh, setting the norms to understand, let alone the roles of us that are actually working in the field and trying to follow up. What's the implication of this? The devil is always in the details. Multinationals will find a way once again in the digital economy to play around with the rules and who are going to be um, the culprits in all this, sufferers in all this, will always be developing countries. Yes, Logan, that is it for me. It's a stronger voice. Let's keep on, let's keep on. They are listening and they are beginning to crack. Thank so you. So we will, uh, uh, thank you so much, Annette. And I'm gonna let us close with this. I, I do wanna say people want to see that paper of yours from the UN workshop. So if you wanna send it to me, then I'll send it out to the members of this chat. They'd love to see it. And um, I do want to note that Giovanna um, Tiegi had just um, said just an input on the matter of rights and duties, um, if possible, considering that many Eastern countries' democracies are forgetting the duty side and its constitutional foundation. So that's just a little observation that in some areas, you know, there's regression going on, you know, going backwards. I just want to thank everybody for this wonderful program, uh, Real, Asha, Annette, and it's just been just a delight to, to listen and be a fly on the wall while you're all talking about these things. Um, and I think we've learned a great deal. And I want to thank everybody who's who's been on this this tax chat for for listening and participating and I'm um, more than happy to take suggestions for future tax chats you can just email me I think you all have my email address you can find it um, so that's it thank you so much all of you bye thank, thank you, you. One last yes. word yes. I see yes many people are requesting for the paper yes uh, the paper presented itself, unfortunately, it's, we won't have it, but I'm glad to say that the full paper has been accepted for publication by the World Tax Journal, and the publication process is proceeding. Very soon, it will be published in the next issue of the World Tax Journal. I will send the published article to you, Nina, to distribute to the rest. Thank you. Excellent. Well, congratulations on that, and thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.